All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello? All right, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Um, so it's my pleasure to be able to, announce the, uh, to introduce the speaker for today, and uh, it's Jennifer Van Saders. Um, she was um, awarded a BS from Rutgers University, and then she continue, continued on working with Mark Pinsno at The Ohio University, uh, her, getting her PhD there. Her research is on stellar evolution, stellar structure, astroseismology, a lot of things having to do with stars. Um, she was recently awarded a Carnegie Princeton Fellowship, and now um, starting this fall is I've working. Been in there for a year. Oh, really? Never mind. It was there? Uh, is at Carnegie now? I continue her work on stellar rotation, and that is what she's going to be talking to us today. So, um, with that. All right. Thanks. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you. Um, I'm going to be telling you about advances that we've made based on the data that's come down from the Kepler mission. And Kepler was designed to look for exoplanets and to study exoplanets, but really, as far as I'm concerned, it's been an excellent stellar astrophysics mission. We've learned a lot from it. So I'm going to be focusing today on gyrochronology in particular, and that's the idea that there's a relationship between the rotation period of a star and its age, and that if you can calibrate this relationship well enough, you can use rotation period to learn about the ages of stars. And so I'll be talking about what Kepler has taught us about that. So why is having precise ages so interesting? Um, if you work on the Milky Way, many of the times that you talk about the construction history of the galaxy, or the age of the galaxy, you're talking about what you know from chemical abundances. You have chemical information and you infer something about the chronology based on it. But it would be really beautiful to have true, precise, stellar ages that allow you to know the chronology itself and then attach chemical information to that afterwards. Likewise, if you study exoplanets, it would be beautiful to have ages for all of your exoplanet host stars. So you can study the evolution of exoplanetary systems as a function of time. When we find the first biomarker of life on another planet, to be able to say how old that planet is. Things like that is reasons why we really care about having precise ages. The problem is, is that precise ages are incredibly difficult to measure. And this is because most of the observables in a star change over the course of the star's lifetime, over a nuclear time scale, which is billions of years. A star like the Sun, with a 10 billion year lifespan on the main sequence, will change its effective temperature by 200 degrees, its luminosity by a factor of two. And when you account for the fact that these things are not easy to measure in and of themselves, and that this is a 10 billion year time span you're talking about, it's very hard to get precise ages. These kind of isochrone placement <coughs> methods generally work to something like 50% and 20% if you're doing a really, really careful job of it. So we need something better. One of the proposals for something better is, this is a paper from Sidney Barnes in 2007 where he goes through it. It's the idea that we should use the relationship between period and age as a chronometer of stars. And that this relationship has value because period is actually relatively straightforward to measure. Not easy, as anybody who does it can tell you, but straightforward at least. We can measure it well, and we can in principle measure it for a lot of stars in a given shot. And this could get you ages for a large sample of stars. And it also has the ability to be quite precise. And I'll go through why that is as we t talk. Further motivation is that, as of today, this is the rotation distribution from the Kepler mission. This is 34,000 <laughs> stars, an order of magnitude, at least more stars than we had before the mission launched. And there's structure in this diagram. There's certainly age information in this diagram. And you would love to be able to take this and turn it into an age distribution and use it for studies of the galaxy. So as I go through the talk today, I'm going to be talking about a smaller subset of the Kepler sample. And this is the astro-seismic <laughs> targets. And I'll talk to you in detail about how we get the information from these stars, how we know their ages, their masses, their radii. All of these stars have measured rotation periods, and we have about 300 of them. And this represents the state-of-the-art stellar sample from this mission. So I'll just touch on them now. You should know that they exist. And as I go through the talk, you'll learn more about them and see how we use them. And I also want to touch on basically the punchline of this talk. If you take away nothing else from today, I want you to take away an image of this diagram. And this is the gyrochronology cheat sheet. It gives you an idea of where you can use gyrochronology, where you need to stop and pause before you use gyrochronology, and where you absolutely should never, ever, ever try to use gyrochronology. So it's color coded here like a, like a street sign. So the green region is the region where we think gyrochronology works. It's either been actually tested and validated there, or we, have, we strongly suspect that things are working all right in that regime. Yellow regions are regions in which we know there are problems in using rotation periods to determine ages. And before you try, it's not that there's no age information in any of these regions. It's that that age information is 
more complicated to get at, or it's an upper limit or a lower limit on the age. And before you say anything about ages based on rotation for stars in those regions, you need to, to recognize that. And the red is a region where you should never use these relationships, period. Just don't do it. Um, okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to go through basically this entire diagram over the t course of the talk. So let's talk about gyrochronology, what it is, and why does it work. So this is the original paper that showed the relationship between period and age in stars. So it's a recognition that the average rotational velocities of stars in young open clusters declined as a function of age. And that, that decline went as a power of t to the negative one half. And this is not a terribly strong exponent, you might say, but it's actually a stronger exponent than most of stel the stellar observables vary with um, as far as age is concerned. So this is the basis for gyrochronology. Now what's going on here? So stars like the sun have deep convective envelopes. Those convective envelopes coupled with rotation are driving magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields, um, well, these stars are losing mass and mass loss in the presence of these magnetic fields means that the mass is forced to co-rotate with the star out to an alphane radius, which can be several stellar radii out to tens of, stel tens of stellar radii. And so you can take a very small amount of mass and lose a very large amount of angular momentum this way. So a star like the sun is going to be born rapidly in its birth cluster, born rapidly rotating in its birth cluster, and thanks to this magnetic braking, will spin down as a function of time on the main sequence. Now, when it hits the subgiant branch over here at the end of the main sequence, it now ignites hydrogen in a shell, begins burning and expanding as it moves across the subgiant branch. This expansion is accompanied by a moment of inertia increase, and so the star experience is a precipitous drop in its rotation rate here due to physical effects. Now, this is the case for a star like the Sun. A star that is more massive, a 1.6 solar mass star, is also born rapidly rotating, but this star has a very thin convective envelope, almost non-existent, and so it doesn't drive a magnetic field, and so it doesn't spin down as a function of time, and so it's born rapidly rotating with whatever set of initial conditions it was given, and it basically just sits there and spins. Now, it too, when it hits the subgiant branch, begins to spin down. Now, this is because it develops a convective envelope for the first time, and also because it's physically expanding as it moves across. And so, again, here you see spin down after you've left the main sequence for these stars. So now, instead of just two stars, we can string a whole group of them together and make a rotational HR diagram. So this is color-coded by rotation rate, where red is rapid rotation, periods of about a day. Blue is slow rotation of periods of about 100 days. Um, this is the main sequence. This is the subgiant branch. Individual mass tracks are shown. And we can identify three particular regions on this diagram. We see the cool main sequence stars. These are things that spin down as a function of time, that have the magnetized winds, and lose angular momentum. These are our prime targets for gyrochronology. Then there are the hot stars, stars born above what we call the craft break, which occurs at about 6,200 degrees, where your convection zone disappears. These stars never spin down. Well, never spin down on the main sequence. And so there is no relationship between period and age, and you should not try to apply a period age relationship to these objects. And then there are the subgiants. The subgiants are complicated. They are a mixture of hot and cool stars on the main sequence. Their rotation rates have been altered by the fact that they've expanded across the subgiant branch. And so interpreting their rotation periods becomes a more difficult process. But it's not that there is no information about, rota about ages embedded in this. You'll note that the most rapidly rotating stars here, the most massive stars are ro most rapidly rotating, will also be the youngest because they have the shortest main sequence lifetimes, the shortest subgiant branch lifetimes. Likewise, the most slowly rotating stars will also be the oldest because they have the longest main sequence lifetimes and spend longer on the subgiant branch. So there's information here. It just takes more effort to get at it. So on this diagram, we've talked then about these two regions. The hot stars are where you should just not use the relationships because there is no relationship between period and age. And the subgiant branch is where it's more complicated to do this. And actually, I've drawn this as a sharp line here, but as you approach this boundary, you should become very cautious about what the period is telling you about ages for these stars. So we can ask whether or not this theoretical picture that I've shown you bears out when we look at the astroseismic targets. So this is the Kepler astroseismic sample shown in a different space. This is age versus period. And plotted on this diagram are two curves that represent literature gyrochronology relationships. So any given mass of star will have a curve that falls somewhere between these two lines. These are kind of limiting masses. So stars that are following the spin down relationship like we think they should, should fall between these two guys. And here it doesn't necessarily look like you would have chosen those two curves to describe this distribution of points. But because these are the Kepler targets, because we know 
very much about these stars. We know precisely whether they're subgiants, dwarfs, or cool hot stars or cool stars. We can break them up into groups. So as you can see in this diagram, the hot stars have a flat period age relationship, just as we expected. There is no period age relationship for these stars. The red stars, which are the cool dwarfs, generally do fall between these two curves, which is encouraging and says that they are spinning down as a function of time. And the subgiants are doing crazy things. They're subgiants that show up at relatively old ages, but rapid rotation compared to the gyrochronology relationships. These are more massive objects that were rapidly rotating. There are subgiants that sit over here at periods that are far too long that you would never see in gyrochronology because they've expanded across the subgiant branch. And if you were to take this star and ask what its age was based on gyrochronology, you wouldn't get two gig years. You'd get something way, way higher. It's also important to note that these populations overlap. There's regions of period space where any given star, just because you see a period at 10 days, doesn't necessarily mean it's a cool dwarf. It can be a range of things. So this drives home the importance of knowing what you're looking at before you try to use um, this tool. But in general, the theoretical picture that we had bears out with the astrocytic example. So let's go back to the cool dwarfs um, and talk about why their period is a nice diagnostic of age. So this is a, an animation that I'm going to play for you that my colleague made. And what she did is she took the open cluster M37. So it's a group of coeval stars. They're all half a giga year old. They're all the same composition. And this is their period distribution as a function of the stellar mass of stars in the cluster. And she said, I'll take this as my initial conditions, and I will apply a theoretical breaking law, a prescription for how you lose angular momentum as a function of time, a breaking law that's calibrated against systems that we know, so it reproduces reasonable rotation rates, and ask how this cluster looks as it moves forward in time. And so I'll play it. And I like this animation because it really nicely demonstrates why gyrochronology can be a powerful tool. You notice as time goes on, everything slides to longer rotation periods, and it does so in a very noticeable way. This is a logarithmic scale here on the y-axis. The difference between a 10-day period and a 40-day period is extremely obvious, and you have a lot of sensitivity to how old you are. You also notice that as time goes on, the sequence converges. And this is because the angular momentum loss law is a strong function of your rotational velocity. If you are born unusually rapidly rotated, I should, I should say, if you look at a very young open cluster, this is a scatter plot. You have a wide range of initial conditions, an order of magnitude. What happens is if you're born unusually rapidly rotating, you're going to spin down unusually quickly. If you're unusually slowly rotating, you spin down unusually slowly, and you end up on this converged sequence. And this is good because the less scatter there is at a given age in the periods, the better, your, the better it will behave when you try to invert the problem and use a period to measure, measure ages. So this is two of the really nice features of gyrochronology, of period age relationships, that make this a nice thing. So this diagram also points to another one of the yellow regions that we, I've shown you here, and that is the initial conditions. So because stars are born with a range of initial conditions and they only lose sensitivity to those initial conditions at late times, it means that if you look at very young stars, their rotation periods are not carrying precise age information anymore. They're telling you for sure that they're young because they're rapidly rotating, but you can't say precisely how young because there's a wide range of periods that are admitted there. So for a star like the Sun, this, this period where you're sensitive to initial conditions lasts for about a half a gig year. For an M dwarf, it looks like that period lasts for something more like three gig years. So there's a region here where all you can say is that this star is behaving like it's a young star and you only have an upper limit on its age. So if we go and we think a little bit more about this simulation and we ask how well does it actually do measuring ages? Now, in the simulation, you've assumed that you know the mapping between period and age perfectly because you've assumed a particular breaking law. The uncertainties are in the fact that there are a range of initial conditions, so when you're given a particular period, you have to say, well, what range of initial, what sensitivity to initial conditions is still lingering? And Courtney injected um, a uncertainty in your ability to measure the period and asked how well does gyrochronology stack up against other techniques for measuring ages. And the answer is extremely well in this idealized case. So this is the, this is the mass rotation age relationship um, as a function, the age precision as a function of mass for a star at five gig years. And you see that it beats out all the other techniques in this idealized case. Astroseismology, and I'll talk about how we get ages from astroseismology, but it basically gives you a age that's good to a fixed fraction of the main sequence lifetime, usually an age that's good to something between 10 and 20%, depending on how you do it. And parallax, 
The idea being that with a parallax, you can measure a distance, which gets you a luminosity. And then luminosity, effective temperature, and composition gets you a position on the HR diagram. You see that it doesn't perform so well. And unfortunately, this is assuming perfect knowledge of the luminosity, effective temperature, and helium. And none of those statements will ever be true. And that only the uncertainty in the metallicity enters. And so this is actually a place where Gaia doesn't save us for main sequence stars. Even with very good information about luminosity of stars, you're still going to have a very hard time getting ages by this method. So this is a place where rotation age relationships are really nice. So what are the mechanics of making this work? I've given you a lot of theoretical discussions, a lot of theoretical modeling of how we do this, but how do we actually turn this into a tool that you can use? So regardless of who you talk to and regardless of which group is working on this, you always end up having to calibrate these relationships. And there are two basic approaches to the problem. There's the purely empirical approach, which says that we're dealing with stars with magnetic fields and mass loss and rotation, which are like the, the hot words for the things we don't know about stars, right? So it's easier to say, I can measure, I have some systems like open clusters, binary stars, astroseismic targets, for which I can get independent ages, have periods, and find a relationship that relates the two of them and call it done. And so these empirical relationships often, but not always, take a form similar to this, where you have a power law dependence on the age, if you're trying to reproduce the Skumanich spin down that was seen in 1972, this power law index is one half. And then you have a term that depends on the stellar mass. Here it's the stellar color that's used as a proxy of mass, as an observable. And there's a wide, this is certainly not everybody, but this is a selection of the people that have gone and people in this room, several people in this room, who have gone and done this exercise. The second approach is to use a slightly more theoretical approach to the problem and say that we can come up with a theoretical breaking law, a prescription for how a star loses angular momentum. And we have some idea of how that breaking law should depend on rotation, mass, radius, convective overturn time scale. But we don't have a very good idea of the absolute strength of that breaking law. So we can set up the functional form of the problem and then calibrate the strength of the breaking based on these targets that have independent ages and measured periods. And this is the camp in which I usually work and these are some of my friends in this same camp who approach the, same, approach the problem in the same way. But in either case, you rely on having calibrators to do this. So this is a plot that I'm going to borrow from Soren from his paper earlier this year, which I think really nicely illustrates the picture here, is that in this, in this picture where you have rotation period, age, and color, stars live on a plane. And your job is to go out and find enough stars and enough places on this plane that you can accurately map out its surface. Before the launch of Kepler, we had stars that lived basically here. We had the sun anchoring on us at old times, but a single mass, and open clusters at young ages. It's the case that most nearby open clusters that are bright and easy to study also happen to be young. It's easier to study young clusters because the stars are rapidly rotating and the amplitudes of any of the rotational signatures are larger. So this was before Kepler. Um, what Kepler does is it stares at a given patch, one patch of sky, 100 square degrees, reads out, it's, it takes an image every 30 minutes or minute, depending on the star that you're looking at, and did it for four years. And so you have these exquisite, high precision, long duration light curves that allow you to learn about these stars. And the way that we learn about rotation from Kepler this way is by looking at rotational spot modulation. So a star in Kepler is sitting there, it's spotted and it's spinning, and as those spots spin into and out of view, you get modulation in the light curve. This is an example of a star that has a 14-day period. You can see the modulation here. We're looking at a 1,200-day time series. Um, and these spots are not constant. They appear and disappear as time goes on. And they might appear and they might reappear in different orientations, different numbers of spots, different places on the star. So you get evolution in the shape of this curve as a function of time, but the underlying periodic modulation is there. There are many ways to extract rotation periods from Kepler light curves. You can do it by using periodograms, an autocorrelation function method, or a wavelet decomposition method. It turns out that probably the best way to go about it, at least in my opinion, is to take all of these methods and kind of use them in concert to make sure that you're not fooled by aliasing or any of the various gotchas that are in Kepler light curves. But this has been done. It's been done for 34,000 stars. It's been validated with exercises where people inject rotational signatures and recover them, and we think it's working very well. So there are two places in Kepler where this kind of rotation information allows us to say something special with gyrochronology. So there are the Kepler open clusters, and there's the seismic sample. Um, Soren has been leading the Kepler 
Kepler open cluster project. Uh, and those open there are four cl open clusters in the Kepler field. Two of them have nice rotation periods, thanks to Soren and company. There's 6811 at one gig year and 6819 at two and a half gig years. And this two and a half gig year cluster represents the oldest open cluster that we have rotational data for. So it is an important, incredibly important anchor point for all of these relationships. Now, in contrast, the seismic targets would cover a portion of this diagram that looks like this. You don't have a huge dynamic range in mass. You can't go too hot because you're looking at stars that don't spin down. You can't go too cool because seismic detectability scales strongly as mass. So it turns out it's very, very hard to see the oscillations on a star that is less massive than the sun. We have a handful of them that were bright enough and close enough that we were able to do it for. But it does allow you to get stars in many different ages. So it's very nicely complementary to the cluster information. So before I jump into the seismic stars, I just want to show you the color, the period, the color period re relationship for 6819, which the thing that should strike you about this immediately is that it's extremely well converged. You get a very tight sequence of stars here. This is exactly what we needed to happen if this was going to be a useful tool. And it's exactly what we predicted would be the case if our picture about gyrochronology was correct. And the nice thing about this is, is you, you can ask, let's just take literature gyrochronology relationships that have never seen this data before and overplot them without any kind of fitting. And you see that some of them, particularly the Barnes 2010 relationship, basically fall on these points as if they had been fit. So it did an exceptionally good job of matching up with this data, which is very, very promising for this as a tool. So with this, you can claim that the gyro ages, at least in this region of parameter space, are good to 10%. So now I'm going to talk about the seismic stars. And unfortunately, the seismic stars are not quite so well behaved. We have found that things are not actually proceeding as we expected. And there's some very interesting discrepancies that we think are actual physical differences between these stars. So before I jump into exactly what we've seen, I'm going to give you a little bit of a crash course on astroseismic ages, because it's something that I think there's a bit of confusion about, because it's something new. And the seismologists use a lot of terminology that can be rough sometimes. So this is an example of an astroseismic light curve. This is the star 16 sig A. This is the rock star of the Kepler field. So this, this basically, you have the sun, and then the next best astroseismic spectrum we have is this star. So I'm showing you the best case. All of this structure here is real if you zoom it in. This has been this is one minute one minute one minute Kepler data, one minute cadence um, for 42 days. What you do is then is you take this light curve, you take a Fourier transform, you subtract the background from granulation, convective granulation, and you get an astroseismic frequency spectrum. And this is a very typical spectrum for a star like the Sun. 16 sig is only slightly more massive than the Sun. 16 sig A. You have this Gaussian envelope of excess power, and you have modes that are evenly spaced in a comb-like pattern. And you can identify each of these modes with a spherical harmonic quantum number, an N and L and an M. And there are a couple of things that you can pull out of this spectrum very easily and very quickly. The first is the location of the frequency of maximum power. The astroseismologists call this new max. The second is this characteristic spacing of the modes, which is called delta nu, the, small, the large frequency separation. It's the difference in frequency between modes of the same degree and consecutive radial order. These two things happen to be related directly to stellar quantities we care about. So nu max is related to log g, there's weak dependence on temperature, and delta nu, the square root of the mean density. So with these two things, you have what you need to get. You have enough powers of m and r to get a mass and radius out of these things. And the nice thing about these astroseismic quantities is you can measure them very, very precisely. Nu max gives you log g to 0.001 dex, which is fantastic when you compare it to spectroscopic measurements. So what this allows you to do is localize a star on the HR diagram extremely, extremely well. So this is one way of getting ages. The second way of getting ages from astroseismology is to do this in a more detailed sense. If you look at this spectrum, and this method in particular, we've left out a lot of the detail that's here, you can go in mode by mode and model each of them, produce a stellar model that predicts the location of each of these modes in frequency space. In particular, this pair of modes here, called the small frequency separation, is sensitive to the age of the star. What this, this spacing actually ends up being sensitive to the gradient of the sound speed in the stellar interior. And that's just a 
complicated way of saying it cares about how much hydrogen you've burned into helium, which is directly related to the age. So this is one of your hooks into getting a really precise age from astroseismology. So not all seismic ages are created equally. Um, you can do this in a multiple different ways, and different ways will give you different precisions. So if you just take an HR diagram approach to this, where you have luminosity, effective temperature, and a composition, I should explain this plot first. So first of all, this is a single star that we're looking at. It's been modeled with several different approaches to including or not including astroseismic information. So each case is a different approach. Each of the points in each case represents a different set of input physics, reasonable input physics, but things like I've decided I'm going to turn diffusion off or I'm going to switch out the opacity table or use a different equation of state. Everything is reasonable, but these are real systematic uncertainties in the theoretical models. So if you just use HR diagram position, luminosity, effective temperature, composition, this is how well you do. You get quite a bit of scatter depending on your input physics. And all these things are reasonable input physics. Nothing here is crazy. If you include the delta nu, nu max, the global astroseismic parameters, which, remember, pin you much more precisely on the HR diagram, you still don't do that well. You're still uncertain. These ages tend to be good to something like 20%, 30%. They're not as fantastic as you would really like. But they are certainly much better because the seismic information is constraining. And this particular kind of seismic information you can get even from very ratty astroseismic frequency spectra. If you detect anything at all, you can basically pull these things out. If you can do the detailed modeling, if you have a high enough signal-to-noise spectrum that you can model it carefully, this is how well you do. So the errors really collapse. You can get ages to 10% or better in some cases. And so this is the place where you'd really like to be working. If you want to do this carefully, these are the astroseismic ages you need to use. So if we go back to this diagram, this is actually represents a mixture of different methods of getting astroseismic ages. And I'm not the first person to think that this was a good idea. Uh, Ruth, who's actually sitting in the audience here, has looked at this first. And she said, well, let's take this sample of stars and the open clusters that we have, and let's find a, let's refit the period age relationship and see what we get. And what she found is that actually, if you use the kind of canonical power law that has been traditional, uh, you don't find a single power law that works for all of the stars. The clusters prefer one, the seismic sample prefers another. You could equally say the young stars prefer one and the old stars prefer another, but it's not clear which of the cases it is. In particular, if you look at the N, remember for Skumanich laws, N is one half. She finds a bimodal distribution in the N. The astroseismic stars prefer a shallower slope to this power law than the cluster stars do. So going back to this diagram, we can say, well, in order to really get at what's going on here, Let's look only at the stars that have very precisely measured seismic ages. Let's, let's try to get as clean a picture as we possibly can. So you can ask how many of these things actually have that kind of modeling. And that brings us down to this. And then we can ask how many of those stars are behaving like nice, well-behaved main sequence oscillators. As you get towards hotter stars, things get fuzzier, and the, the, actually, the modes actually get fuzzier, uh, and it's harder to determine ages. As you move on to the subgiant branch, you begin seeing mixed modes in these stars that have character as both pressure mode and G mode, and it becomes more complicated to model. So we want only simple things, which brings us down to here. And then we want only things that have spent all of their main sequence lives below 6,200 degrees, which brings us to here. So we have 21 stars in this entire sample that actually meet all of these criteria. But these are very well studied, 21 stars. They have high resolution spectroscopy, the best seismic modeling available, and we basically know everything about them as well as you could know something about a member of a binary, or maybe even better in some cases. So we go forward with this, and we say, I have a set of models that is a full evolutionary grid, has predictions for how a star should rotate as a function of time. And I can say, because I know the ages, rotation periods, and masses of all of these stars, what periods would I have predicted to see for this particular subset? And I can compare it to the periods that I actually observed. And when you do that, you find something interesting. So this is the period ratio. The expected period is in the numerator, the observed period in the denominator. So things that are rotating more rapidly than you would have thought they should be should sit above the curve. Things more slowly rotating than you thought they should have been would be below. And this is as a function of age. The color coding here is by effective temperature of the star. The sun is here. And it's a little bit messy, but what you should notice is that as you go to older ages, there seems to be an overwhelming tendency for stars to sit well above the one-to-one -one line rotation rates that are more rapid than you expected them to be. 
And you can immediately say, well, this is, this is selection bias. And there's certainly things you should worry about. You should worry that you know, maybe these stars are just the rapid rotators of a range of rotation rates, and that's why you've picked them up. The cluster 6819 is so well converged that that doesn't seem like that's probably the case, but you worry about it. You worry about astroseismic detection of effects, which are strong. You worry about your detection pipeline. We've gone through all of these things. I can talk to you in detail about why we've convinced ourselves that we're not just seeing a selection bias here. Uh, but we don't think we are. We think this is real. So if it's real, what, are you, what is it that we're actually looking at? So it helps to break this down by effective temperature. It makes things cleaner and allows you to visualize it better. So let's just take a narrow slice in effective temperature. We're going to do it by ZAMS, zero H main sequence effective temperature. We work in the ZAMS because we want to pick stars that have had basically the same rotational evolution. And your effective temperature is, sets the base of your convection zone, which sets how strong your breaking is. So by picking things at the same effective temperature, you pick objects that should have spun down the same way. So let's look at stars around the sun. And we can add into this picture open clusters. So these are the average rotational period ratios now, expected versus observed, for um, M37, Praesipi, 6811, 6819, the sun. And these are the seismic targets. And you see here, it looks very, except for this guy, which is a little bit evolved, things sit well above this curve in a very clear sense. It looks like things are working, and then they aren't. So you could ask, what, what, could, what physically could possibly be going on here? None of the breaking laws we have produce anything that looks like this. So how can we modify the breaking law in such a way that we might be able to reproduce this behavior? And what we've come to is that we think the Rossby number, which is the ratio of the rotation period to the convective overturn time scale, is very, very important for determining the rotational behavior. So when the Rossby number is close to one, when these two numbers are very comparable, you would expect that the magnetic dynamo in the star was healthy. Your magnetic dynamo is generated by shearing and turbulence, and it's the combination of the rotation and the convection that is driving your dynamo. When these numbers become very dissimilar, you can imagine that your dynamo becomes weaker. If your rotation period is much, much longer than your convective overturn time scale, you don't get the interplay between these two things. So either at very small Rossby numbers or very large Rossby numbers, you can imagine that your pretty dynamo picture breaks down and things don't generate magnetic fields the way they did. There are a number of circumstantial pieces. Well, there's one paper in particular that says directly that this could happen. And there are a bunch of other cases in which the Rossby number looks like it's important. It's been used to describe young open clusters. It's something that matters for the transition between slow rotation and rapid rotation across the craft breaks. So you have things, as you move to the hot stars, those hot stars have vanishingly thin convective envelopes, short convective overturn time scales. The Rossby numbers become very large. So this is a place where Rossby number plays a part. Um, and it's also the case that magnetic field morphology affects how you break. So if your Rossby number dictates something about how your field is generated, maybe the morphology of your field, how high order your field is, it could affect your magnetic breaking. So what we say is, let's postulate that at a particular Rossby number, stars stop breaking. A star like the sun will increase in Rossby number as it ages. Its convective overturn time scale doesn't change much, but as it ages, it spins down. So its Rossby number gets larger and larger. So let's say at a particular Rossby number, the star ceases breaking because its magnetic field changes or the dynamo shuts down, something like this. What would we get? So this is an example of where we start. So these are the open clusters, the sun, and the seismic data. This sun is a little bit, this is the fiducial theoretical model. This is our prediction before we saw anything strange happening. The sun is a little offset from this model because we're looking at a bin of effective temperature and the models at a slightly different effective temperature than the sun. That's all that is here. Say, what happens if I institute a Rossby, critical Rossby threshold of three? You get something that looks like this. The evolution would track the original model perfectly until you hit the critical Rossby threshold, at which point the star stops breaking and coasts. Now you'll see that the period is increasing anyway, and this is because the star is very close to the end of the main sequence and it's now starting to physically expand. So you're not losing angular momentum anymore, but you are appearing to spin down because you're physically expanding. Now you can go to a lower Rossby number, Rossby number of two and one. And in the case of one, you really see this. You see the evolution tracks normally up until the critical point. You coast until you begin to evolve off the main sequence and your physical expansion plays a role. And we can ask which Rossby number fits this best. The answer is 2.16 uh, with some error bars. 
this is the kind of the region in which stars with this model would populate. Remember, this is a, the a bin in effective temperature, so there's some fuzziness to this that a two-dimensional plot doesn't quite give you. The interesting thing is, uh, is that this is around, this is exactly, actually, the Rossby number of the sun in our models. And this is by coincidence. This is, was not fit. This fit was not done with the sun in particular. If you do it again with the sun included, you get the same answer, because you have to, you have to match the fact that the sun is here and these stars are here. So it kind of forces you there. But even without the sun in the fit, it does this. So you can ask, how does this look if we go back to the period ratio picture? So this gray region is where models with this Rossby threshold would live. So you see that it, I mean, it's fit to do so, but it, it does a, quite a nice job. Now, if you go to cooler stars, a cooler effective temperature bin, you see something a little bit different. Now, instead of the discrepancy setting in at about you know, the age of the sun here, it now sets in at six to seven gig years instead. So we only have three of these cool stars because seismic detectability is hard. Um, but you see that even the very fairly old ones look like they're rotating normally. It's not until you look at the very oldest group of these stars, or a single star, that you start to see that it looks like it might be, be behaving strangely. Same is true if you go to the hotter stars. It's a little rattier here, but you see that Things are basically okay here. You expect to see discrepancies showing up around three gig years, and you do. So it's this effective temperature trend that really convinced me that we might have it here. So what does this mean then for gyrochronology? This is this yellow region here on this diagram, anomalous main sequence rotation. So this sets in kind of regardless of what your mass is at roughly halfway through your main sequence lifetime is when this effect starts to become important. And what it means is that when you try to interpret a rotation period for stars that live in this band, you need to be careful again, because now your rotation reflects the fact that you were breaking on the main sequence, and then you stopped breaking, and you're now coasting. So it gives you a limit on your age. It says you must be older than this. But depending on how strong this, this truncation of the breaking is, which is something that we will investigate with a larger sample when we have it, you will be able to say, you may not be able to say precisely how far past this critical boundary you actually are. So that's a picture with this diagram. So how can we, where do we go with this in the future? So there are a couple of places where we could get a lot more information if, if we can manage to pull it out. So there's a cluster, M67, which will be observed in the K2 mission. This is the two-wheeled Kepler mission. Kepler lost two of its reaction wheels. So instead of staring at its nominal field, it's now doing fields along the ecliptic in 80-day shots. And M67 is in one of these fields. It's going to be hard to get rotation from 67 because it's faint and it's crowded, and it was hard enough for the 2.5 giga year old cluster. But there's a hope of doing so. And the nice thing about M67 is it, it straddles this boundary in a very nice place in mass, which means that the lower mass part of M67 should behaving, be behaving normally. It's a 4 giga year old cluster and the higher mass part of that cluster should be behaving strangely. So we make a prediction about what we should see if we're able to pull out rotation periods for this cluster. And it would be nice, too, because it would anchor a conclusion based on astroseismic ages to the cluster scale, which is something that clusters are the gold standard in this field, and it'd be very nice to tie results together to make sure that everything agrees. There's a second cluster, 6791, this is in the original Kepler fields, but it is old and faint and hard to do. So we haven't been able to pull out rotation periods yet, but I still have hope that someday we'll have rotation periods to play with for this older cluster. And then there's also, in the future, TESS. So TESS is a space mission that's designed to look at the nearby bright stars. It's going to be all sky over the course of two years. It's looking for transiting exoplanets. It's looking for exoplanets around bright stars so that we can better study them. But in doing so, it also meets the criteria for an astroseismic mission. So it will get more astroseismic targets. It won't get a ton more than Kepler did. It will probably double our sample when it's all said and done. But you will get a sample of bright, well-studied stars with astroseismology all over the sky this way. And so they can help to fill in this region here a little bit better and further test whether or not this anomalous main sequence rotation holds up to larger data sets. I just want to point out in this diagram one more thing. Um, there is a large green region here. And this green region is mostly the M-dwarfs. And the M-dwarfs haven't been terribly well tested. We've, we've tested things pretty well down here, thanks to the open clusters. 
We are starting to test things up here thanks to astroseismology. The M-dwarfs, you won't get with astroseismology because, the detectab again, the detectability problem. The, the amplitudes of the oscillations are just too small. We're not going to see them with any existing or planned mission, unfortunately. And we don't have many open clusters that give us information, so we haven't really tested the M-dwarfs terribly well. But it, we have no reason thus far to suspect that they wouldn't be working normally. And if they do, this gives us a large region of parameter space where rotation periods are relatively easy to me measure. There are lots of stars there, lots of interesting stars there, stars with planets, that gyrochronology could be an incredibly powerful tool for. So I'm just going to leave the, this is, I'm gonna leave the talk with that, with this plot up, with just a hope that when you think about this as a tool, you think about this diagram, you think about there being regions where the kind of traditional empirical relationships that are fairly simple seem to work very well and they've been well tested, and that there are also regions where rotation period still tells you about age, and there's lots of interesting physics in why it tells you about age, but that you do need to pause and think and be careful about the way that you extract ages for stars in these regions. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, time for questions? Yes, uh, very, very interesting talk, uh, very intriguing. Um, I was wondering, you showed these uh, rotation periods versus the expected rotation periods, uh, according to the technology relationships. And you had a couple of stars in the solar mass regime and in the slightly more mass regime that were not rotating too quickly, but that were too sort slow. of slow as you expect them to be. What do you think is going on with those? Is that, do you think they are outliers, or do you think rotation rate is again diverging yeah. at the end of the main sequence life? So I, I, they are, those stars tend to be further along the subgiant branch a little bit. They're not far enough along to really explain why they're that slowly rotating, so in that sense they are outliers, but I suspect that has something to do with the evolution. Um, when you look at those models, when you start getting near the, the subgiant branch like that, small mistakes uh, in models or uncertainties in models, the difference between two different sets of model grids starts changing your predicted rotation period a lot because you spin down quite quickly once you pass that subgiant boundary. So I, I think that's what's going on there. I think that's what the problem is. But I, I too, am still suspicious of those stars. Um, I was wondering if there was other ways in which the astroseismology stars and the uh, stars in the open clusters might be different, like chemical composition or dynamical history. Yeah, so the chemical compositions certainly are different. The seismic stars have a much wider range of compositions. They're anywhere from kind of minus 0.4 to plus 0.4. Uh, so that, that was one of the challenges of modeling it, because in an open cluster you have a nice sequence to work with, but in the field you're dealing with everything all over the place and only 20 stars. Um, they tend to be, let's see, they will tend to probably be slightly more massive than the average, I don't know if that's true, than the average cluster star. It's, composition is the largest difference between them. And, and I should say that the, the composition dependence to the breaking is not terribly well understood. Like I have, I have theoretical models that predict the effect of composition on all the parameters that, that govern the breaking law, but that is not tested. You know, you, if you believe that the convection zone depth is an important part of how fast you break, then <coughs> it works. But uh, that's something that needs to be calibrated. So one of the other ideas that I've heard mentioned for explaining changes in this model is that it's four on four decoupling. Could that explain some of the differences that you see? Hmm. So so I think, so certainly core envelope decoupling is something that explains what happens in very young open clusters. Because you see discrepancies between what you would have expected and what you actually see there. I think in the older, the, the picture at least as far as I'm aware is that the older stars have already undergone whatever core envelope decoupling episode they would have had when they were born. And the coupling time scales are tens to hundreds of millions of years. So I should have done that. And if you look at a star like the Sun, where we know the interior rotation profile down to 0.2 solar radii because of helioseismology, it is rotating like a solid body. So it seems like these things, it seems like a solid body rotation assumption here is a good one. Um, core envelope decoupling will be important on the subgiant branch probably, when again you get a sharp contrast. But I think on the main sequence, probably probably not so much for the old ones. The back. Uh, so the VOSPI number, I understand you were using to sort of constrain the magnetic field in some sense. Yeah. Can't you use X-ray flux? 
Uh, very nice X-ray flux. Right. So, if, so actually, the way the way in which the breaking law that we so the the breaking law that we use, uh, you need to give it a magnetic field, a mass loss rate, and an escape velocity, which are not things that are like readily measure, measurable. So, the X-ray flux is one of the ways that we tie observable quantities of stars into this breaking law that we use mm -hmm. for the scalings. Um, but as far as as far as looking at the X-ray flux for this particular sample of stars, I haven't done it yet. Uh, I actually don't know if it exists for this sample. Uh, I would say no. I don't think it does. Are there any stars in the clusters that have an astro seismology age? So there are no overlapping stars. So if you're looking at the, the cluster, the, the main sequence stars that you're doing gyrochronology for, none of them have astro seismology because they're faint and crowded. There is the case in 6819, the two and a half gig year old cluster has astro seismic giants, where you can get the, the process of getting ages for giant stars from astro seismology is similar, slightly different, um, but just as viable. And there the ages for the astro seismic giants match up very, very well with the ages from the open cluster modeling, for the main sequence stars. So, so the scale is tied. There's also the case that we have 16 sig, which is actually binary. If you model both binary co components, Astro seismically, you get the same age for them without fitting it. Uh, the same age, like within 0.1 giga year. It's very, very precise. Uh, and astro seismology will reproduce the age of the sun without, I mean, it should. That's the first test you do, but it does. So uh, it's been tested in a couple of cases thus far, and it's, it's done well so far. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that these older stars use their. Um, are memor memorably less in terms of uh, their initial conditions and rotation rates. Um, you mentioned that for the rotation rates, what about the astro seismology? Um, what kind of uh, systematics are there in the initial conditions of propagating to measure the... For the astro seismology. Um, so the rotation... So the rotation will affect you in so much as you increase the amount of mixing that a star has and the amount of available fuel. Um, for slow rotation rates, that's probably not very important, and so the answer would be there's probably not much care at all in the astro seismic ages as far as this. If you start looking at slightly more massive stars, stars where core overshooting becomes more important or where the rotation is more rapid and you care more about the mixing, um, there might be some, you might worry about there being systematics due to the fact that you're, you're still gonna get an astro seismic age, but it's gonna, it's going to be incorrect if you didn't model it with the correct physics. Um, and that's, a, that's not something that we've investigated very deeply with this particular set of stars. Most of them are low enough mass and slowly enough rotating that we expect it won't be a problem, but it's certainly something to keep in mind when doing this. Any more questions? Sword? Jennifer, very, very nice talk. Um, so I think it's, as you know, it's very important to complement the cluster data with field study. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, getting the periods is hard, yeah. right? So this is assumed the periods are right. The ages for the for the um, for the field stars. So you show the plot with the precision can't be really good without the seismology comparing yeah. all the different you know mythologies. But what what might cause systematic shifts in after seismic ages? So do we have any concerns about that? So there could be. I mean, the the prediction of where the frequency should show up based on a stellar model is the pretty straight straightforward process. It's not too. You, I wouldn't be concerned about saying, I have a stellar model. If you, if you were sure you knew the physics of your stellar model, the prediction of the frequencies is very straightforward. So I don't think the problem would be there. I think the problem would be, and you've got the model wrong. You're systematically, you see, you know, you've done, you haven't included diffusion, or you've included too much diffusion, or there's overshooting, you, some, some systematic problem in the stellar model physics that gets you. We did do the exercise of asking, you know, if you systematically shift the entire astro seismic age scale around, how much do you need to shift it by before, you know, you could say that, well, the seismic age scale is just wrong. These are actually all much younger, thus they'd be more rapidly rotating, so there's no problem. And you actually have to do quite a bit of a, you have to shift it by 20 to 30 percent, which is large. And if you compare different, different codes, different people doing astro seismology, the differences between any two groups is usually smaller than 10 percent. So I think, I think the systematics in the astro seismic ages are the same systematics you worry about in any ages because they're tied to the same physical uncertainties in the stellar models. And that the prediction of the frequencies itself is not, is not too risky as far as this is 
do the models include convective coral shooting? Some of them do. Yeah, and, and when we do, so we've, we've modeled this group of stars with both convective core overshooting and without it, and it doesn't change the conclusions at all. The, the stars that are modeled with the core overshooting, they answer, their ages change actually very little, because they're close enough, they're far enough, low enough mass, that it's not very important yet. Any more questions? So, uh, if there's a critical Rossby number where the magnetic dynamo shuts down, they start coasting. Um, what effect would that have on like the spots that would create via right. the rotation signal? Yeah. So I, I've been thinking about this, and I think the answer is I'm not sure uh, because <laughs> you you could imagine easily that this whole system kind of shuts down together. At which point you expect the spots and any activity indicators to to damp out along with the. The, the breaking anomalies showing up. But the reality of this is, I mean, we see these stars in spot modulations. They have magnetic fields. They are active. So it could also be the case that, you know, there's this very strong morphology dependence to the breaking. The dipole field is the thing that does all of the breaking for you. It's the longest lever arm. The spots are arguably a smaller scale field thing. So you can imagine that at some point, your, the effectiveness of your dynamo as a whole is weaker. You lose the ability to generate a large-scale magnetic field, and you begin. You focus on this. You have a small-scale field that lingers. So that's that's the picture that I have been thinking about and thinking about ways to test it. With um, what I what I'd really like to see is direct magnetic field measurements of these stars, and morphology measurements would be beautiful. I, it hasn't been done yet. They're not that bright, but they're fairly bright for the Kepler field. So. I haven't talked to anybody yet who's an expert in this stuff and can tell me if it can be done for these guys. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, you have, people have high resolution spectroscopy. Yeah. Um, which would tell you the lithium abundance of these stars, and possibly if anything crazy happened to them in their lifetimes, that might also influence their uh, rotational evolution. For example, I saw today in the archive that 16 sigma is like has a higher lithium abundance in the sun, even though it's like four billion years older. Three. So, um, yeah. has that been looked at as like possibly like there's something so, there's something happened to this sample, and that's why their rotation periods manifested in a measurable way? Right. Yeah. So we we've thought about it. We have high resolution spectroscopy um, for all of these stars. There are a few of them that are known binaries, but they're very wide binaries. Uh, Half of them are planet hosts. Actually, all of the triangles in this diagram are planet hosts. They were embargoed for a long time, and we got our hands on them recently. I can never get back to the plot. Yeah. Uh, they're all planet hosts that have Earth mass planets at fairly wide orbits. And so there's no noticeable difference between the seismic sample that has planets and the seismic sample that doesn't, which you could say is because, well, everything has planets, at which point, if everything has planets and all planets affect rotation, then it's kind of, it's, maybe my theory is wrong, but the problem is still there. Um, but we haven't seen any difference between the two groups of stars that points to anything particular odd, particularly odd happening to them. And there's one sample, there's one star in here, uh, 16 sig A and B, which actually doesn't have a spot modulation rotation period. This is actually a seismic rotation period. So seismology, when a star is rotating, you can get splitting of the modes that allows you to measure rotation rates. And the way that this particular star is done, um, the rotation rate is very sensitive to the very outer envelope of the star. So you're not, you're not catching deep interior, looking at the surface rotation rate. And you find that 16 sig is both, both companions are rotating, here you can see it, with the same kind of anomalous rotation as stars that do show up in spot modulation. So it's, it's, not, it's not great evidence, but it's some evidence that even the stars you don't see behave strangely. Isn't it statistically very unlikely that half of those stars would host planets, host <laughs> transiting planets? I don't know, I don't know, Jason. <laughs> um, so the answer for this is, let's see, so this seismic sample, so, so there, there's, some, there's some people problems here, right? So you have a seismic sample, you have a limited number of seismologists because this is like, this is like a, black belt stuff who are doing this. So they do, they do their seismic sample that was targeted particularly with Kepler to do seismology. The planet people find 
host, client hosts, and they have them embargoed for a long time. And then they work out a deal with the seismologists to model the planet hosts. So, and the planet hosts have much, much longer time series than the seismology. Most of these seismic targets only have a month or 90 days. Yeah. The planet hosts get, you know, as many quarters as they were known for. Yeah, so, okay. so that actually lets you dig much further down in magnitude, so you get many more targets available to you. So yeah, it is statistically very unlikely. Okay. Any more questions? Right, let's go ahead and thank the speaker again.